Well, thanks, Chris, and really appreciate everyone for uh, uh, being here um, and uh, those that are, are tuning in otherwise. Um, I think one of the best things about being faculty in this course, um, and, and I've been before, is, is you get to come to the course and enjoy the course. And uh, I've learned a lot today, and, um, and I'm hoping that you'll get something out of this talk. But we're going to try a little something different. And we're going to play a little bit with this uh, talk and see if we can all uh, get a little something out of it. I do have some disclosures. I do speak on the topic of ultrasound um, in other areas where I do uh, I receive some remuneration for it. I'm, and I'm on the board of some uh, uh, physiatry groups. Um, the goal here is to go through ultrasound applications in the training room, but we're going to speak um, broadly. If you, you know, do a lit search on ultrasound applications in the training room, you're not going to find a whole lot of information. You might find a publication that Dr. Ahmad and I put together um, and some of our experiences with it, but you're not going to find um, a lot else. But I'm hoping that you'll walk away from this understanding, understanding where it can be a difference maker. And I'll give you a couple reference points from a case perspective that, that might help bring it home. And, and we'll do that. <clears throat> the uh, AMSSM is, has uh, singled out diagnostic ultrasound that it allows the patient to get accurate and timely information from their physician regarding the injury. And um, there's nothing more timely than being in the training room or on the sideline. There's nothing more timely than being there in the moment when the injury is occurring. And what does it mean to do ultrasound? All right, so a lot of people might say this. Oh, we do ultrasound. Hey, look at this over there in the corner. We do it. It's in the basement. Uh, we do it. We do ultrasound. But I want to give you a little reference point because, you know, who is doing the ultrasound may make a difference. Um, you might want to look for credentialing. Um, the, there is a uh, registration uh, for physicians that are applying ultrasound that's through the APCA, something you can look for. It's called the RMSK uh, credential. Um, you want to look and say, okay, did, did somebody do a fellowship in this? Um, they can spend, you can spend up to a year and and immersing yourself in this in sports medicine fellowships. And then from an experience standpoint, do you have clinical experience that you can actually apply in the time when you're making the diagnosis? Very different than a radiographic experience, right? You send someone to a radiologist, you're not expecting a clinical interpretation. But with sonographic applications, you've got a clinical experience overlaid with a radiologic understanding and a sports specific um, exposure and and is this person also training other people so you know we see hundreds of trainees in our sports fellowship in our in our uh, residency program so so the the ultrasound images that I'm going to put up on the screen have some peculiarities to them they're in grayscale right so they're black and white with grayscale in between and if I put up images you're going to say to me Chris what are we looking at so what I want to do for you is to give you a little bit of a reference point here, okay? The reference point, I'm going to tune your eye a little bit to the images. Every handful of lectures, I like to do this. I didn't do this last year. I'm, I'm going to do this with you today and bring you through uh, tuning your eye a little bit to ultrasound. So what are we looking at here? What we're looking at is a grayscale image. There's black and white dots all over the place. Patients like to say, well, I don't know how you look, you know what you're looking at. I'm like, I don't know either, but you practice. And so here, here's what the ultrasound position is. It's, uh, it's looking at an anatomic axial plane. So the body structure that should be under there, well, of course, the anterior deltoid should be under there. But the other thing you should be thinking about is the subscap should be under there, right? So now we're back to our image. Well, what exactly are we looking at? Well, the top of the screen is near the surface of that transducer. What we're looking at is the very top layer on that screen, I'm going to darken it up a little bit, is the subcutaneous fat. Okay, subcutaneous fat goes away. Now you see a little bright line there. That's deep fascia. We learned about fascia earlier today. We heard about fascia being pulled up and uh, extended in that uh, physiologic process that occurs with cupping. Joe did a, did a great job with that and helped us understand that. Um, deep to the deep fascia is muscle. All that muscle we're darkening up, that muscle is the deltoid. That's the anterior deltoid sitting right over the top there. So we're going to darken that up. So now we can understand, well, okay, now we darken the both of them. Now we see that bright line of the deep fascia. On the bottom, there's a little curved line there. Now we darken that up. That's all bone shadow. So we see bone on the bottom. And what's left? All that's left is the tendon in between. 
So I'm going to put yellow on that. What tendon is, is intercalated fibers like this, woven together fibers of, of tendon. And you all know that, but we're looking at it in a longitudinal plane. So you can actually see those fibers. You could measure those fibers. And <clears throat> if we darken that up a little bit, we get a sense of the surface superficial to it, which is the bursa. And the bursa being bright, dark, and then bright because you've got the deltoid layer and then the, and then the subscap layer. Okay, so now if we darken everything up, now we see we've got the bright layer of the deep fascia, the bright layer of the bursa, the bright layer of the bone. One, two, three. You tune your eye to this, and this is what we do in ultrasound. You tune your eye to this because then you all of a sudden start to get a representative image of, in your mind of what you're looking at. A coloring board, if you will, subcutaneous tissue, fascia, muscle, bursa, tendon, periosteum, and then the bony acoustic shadow that's underlying it. That's what we're looking at on the screen, okay? So, so you let that wash over you because if, as I throw up other images, you can start to tune your eye a little bit into what looks like muscle, what looks like tendon, what looks like what. And I'm not gonna throw a lot of rotator cuff stuff up here. I'm not trying to teach you ultrasound, but I want you to understand a little bit what, what we are looking at. Because we apply ultrasound in a whole host of ways in the training room environment and outside of the training room environment. And that's to, and some of the best ways that we can do this is to look at the soft tissues. And muscle and tendon is a great target. As you just saw in the image, you can find problems and find them quickly. Now, the sonographic features of an intramuscular hematoma is extremely helpful. Positive Doppler signals, disorganized fibrous tissue, tissue signal within muscle, all of this is extremely easy to see and <clears throat> correlates with time to return to play. You can use, sorry, if I can go back to the last one. You can use the ultrasound to make a determination on injury risk prediction. What does the muscle look like? What does the tendon look like under the ultrasound? And is this person going to go back and uh, be ready to play? Or are they going to injure themselves? And you decrease the time to treatment by bringing ultrasound into the training room. So this is a long view of a medial gastroxoleus complex um, using a, 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 a player in a training room. And what you see here, and so, you know, it, you see a dark, a dark ellipse right here, dark ellipse. That's a hematoma. Um, extremely helpful to identify that in a training room environment because this image, although it's taken only a handful of days after the, the injury, is already starting to, to show some echoes on the in-between in side. And <clears throat> that can reveal some organization of the hematoma and, some, and that will help you define whether this hematoma is going to become a seroma or you know, is going to be amenable to uh, aspiration. This can give you a really quick clue as uh, if there's going to be something that you can do oh, other way. Here we go. Now, if you let uh, hematomas sit and hematomas, I'm, I'm singling out a little bit here because we can play with that. Um, they can scar down and, and they often will. Um, they can also become um, uh, calcified uh, areas in the muscle. And uh, one of the things that we're going to look at on ultrasound is going to be that shadowing deep to uh, the bone. And if there's calcification, we'll see shadowing deep to the calcification in the muscle. And this is a cross section of a rectus femoris. And you can see uh, the vastus intermedius deep to it and vastus medialis over here and the shadowing from the femur. Um, again, you know, you get a sense of the organization of the or disorganization of the repair of that of that hematoma. So um, in this case, I'm just going to throw up in a, a little bit of a, a thought process here. We have a 17 year old uh, playing shortstop who's uh, has sudden onset of quad pain while fielding a ground ball um, infield grounder. He had sudden sharp pop mid thigh fullness comes into the training room with tenderness, pain with loading. And you see him. Well, this is what we see. So here again, we've got the rectus femoris. This is a, the rectus femoris is a great muscle to look at because it's a muscle in a muscle um, because of the orientation of the direct and the indirect portions of it. We see the central portion of that rectus femoris pulled straight back out. 
This is looking at a longitudinal view of the rectus femoris. So you can see the fibers of the muscle here. See the fibers of the vastus intermedius here. And the hyperechoic areas are, um, are, the, are the, the denser areas of the muscle, right? The epimecium, the paramecium. Epimecium and paramecium are, are bright. The endomecium and, and, um, the, and the fluidic portion of the muscle itself, the sarcomeres, are dark. So <clears throat> here we are. Now we look at it in cross-section, and you can get a measurement on this. Why is this helpful? Training room environment, you need to make a decision. Okay, how are you going to manage this? Is it, is it a small strain? Is there fluid? Will this fluid become a seroma? This fluid will become a seroma, and you can leave it. But this will, this will sit there and then become a seroma. And even though you only have um, a centimeter or a, in one direction and a half a centimeter in the other, you've got, you know, pretty, pretty substantial, um, you know, pullback of the, of the rectus femoris there. So what, because you've got the central tear, you can make some decisions about it. And the decision that we decided to make was to do an ultrasound guided aspiration. Now, the aspirations, the training room's not always, and depending on your setup, not always the place to do procedures. Our preference is to do the procedures in the hospital. Um, you, have you have control, you've got a lot of um, assistance if you need it, you've got backup if you need it, um, and uh, you have a lot more supplies uh, on hand, depending on your setup. Um, for us, doing this aspiration results in something like this. So here you see an approximation of those two heads, of those two portions of the rectus femoris, that direct and the indirect head, and a reapproximation. And now you're much less likely to develop a seroma in that area, and much more likely to develop some uh, fibrous knitting together of the tissue. So ultrasound can be used to serial follow muscle healing um, with muscle tears and uh, myotendinous tears. Reassurance. Reassurance is extremely helpful, especially in the training room environment. 70% uh, of hamstring injuries have no evidence of muscle fiber disruption on MRI. And ultrasound agrees with MRI 95 to 100% of the time, depending on what you look at. Hamstring, it's 95%. So why the 5% discrepancy? Here's why. Cut to the chase. Dynamic assessment. With ultrasound, you can resist a little bit of hamstring uh, pull and you can see a fiber pullback. Now, if you see a tear and it's small, you can give reassurance. If you see no tear, you can give reassurance. If you see a pristine tendons in the beginning of the year, the longitudinal studies that have been done looking at tendons without tendinopathy in the lower limb, Achilles and patellar, um, demonstrate almost never do those tendons go on for uh, to rupture or tear. So you can re be reassured that you've got a healthy individual. If you want to get a really good diagnostic um, accuracy, you're going to go ahead and give a little bit of a dynamic assessment as well. What can we look at with bone? Rib fractures are fantastic for this. Ultrasound is the best diagnostic modality for rib fractures, um, exceeding uh, every radiographic uh, approach that you'll have. Um, it's much better because you can point to where the problem is, put the ultrasound right there, and see the fracture immediately um, with no additional radiation. Its um, diagnostic accuracy is 100%. Finger and toe fracture is extremely helpful. Um, stress fractures, not as much. Um, you, need, you need an MRI for that. But it can be helpful, and there's some really nice studies looking at periosteal liftoff and periosteal changes um, with, uh, with um, metatarsal fractures and tibial fractures, uh, stress fractures. Joints and ligaments, well, one of, the one of the really helpful diagnostic criteria we can look at is looking at the space between the um, uh, humerus and the ulna. Um, and as we're assessing that, that ulnar collateral ligament here, looking at the anterior band and the common flexor sitting over the top, and we see that here represented on the ultrasound image. And um, a diagnostic assessment of a UCL, you're going to talk about elbow tomorrow, so I won't have to go into this extensively. But um, this is very helpful um, to find out right away if that 
uh, joint is lax and you expect a little bit of laxity when someone's warmer, but uh, if there's excessive motion, the dynamic assessment's critical here. And of course, just without the dynamic assessment, you can look very clearly if you've got an ulnar collateral ligament on one side and you look on the contralateral side, you get that side-by-side -side comparison really quick right there in the training room, looking at one focused area to define if there's pathology or if there's not. Now, I just want to talk a little bit more on, on this point. We talk on procedural guidance, ultrasound guidance. It's in plane. We can look at that needle and guide it down. Ultrasound is a high... Um, high accuracy, um, 40 to 100% more fluid taken off um, than palpation guided, um, very high accuracy and very helpful for some of our biologic injections. And um, that, that's true for all things, including uh, joints and bursae. And uh, here you can see that, uh, that fluid sort of distending the bursa out real nicely. And you can see that, make sure it goes in on ultrasound. Um, so a couple, couple quick things here. Um, this is a, a case we had, collegiate ba ball player is uh, had pain during acceleration and deceleration phase of throwing uh, that was absent at rest. Um, interestingly, during the his historic portion of the uh, encounter, um, he broke his right index fingernail a month ago, so changed his grip. So this was the pre-grip, broke his nail because that hurt. This was the post-grip, so he was spinning. Well, sorry. He was getting pain radiating down the lateral forearm associated with a loss of pitch control because he was supinating and pronating a lot more. So eccentric supination, um, the radial nerve goes through the supinator. Here's the normal side, nice little tube uh, hose. Here's the abnormal side and we see a kink on the hose. And that's something we can look at dynamically as well. You can see that eccentric supination at the, at the arcator froche was crushing it down. A um, couple, couple more slides here. Uh, we've got a 19 year old uh, right hand dominant player who had COVID and we see this is it related to COVID? Is it not? Hard to know. Full recovery had anterior shoulder pain down to the thumb, tenderness all along the pec major and minor, thinking that there is um, some of the thoracic outlet signs are positive. And, um, uh, but otherwise, uh, cuff has got no impingement and, and there's full range. And some of that, uh, those scapular signs that you see, those anterior tilt and things like that. We love looking at the uh, pec major under ultrasound and the pec minor. Um, I've personally spent a lot of time looking at this, dissecting cadavers, spending uh, some good amount of time getting the anatomy just right. Um, it's very cool. And the brachial plexus, and all that was normal on him. But skip to the juicy part here. That was his normal side, pec minor. This was the abnormal side. Oops, look at that pec minor. Bowed out. Now, this is one of those pec minor signs. We look for a 40% increase in the height of the pec minor over the over the plane um, uh, of the pec minor and the a deep aspect, and that's because the brachial plexus underneath it is is pulling it down. It's also one of the things that we see correlating with that thoracic uh, outlet symptom. So injection there um, gave him outstanding relief for uh, three weeks later. Arm symptoms were gone. So bottom line, training room ultrasound gets players care. <clears throat> excuse me, gets the players the care faster. It gets them the care more accurately. You can educate your players. You can reassure them when appropriate. You can educate the team and reassure them as well, and it helps you guide your treatment. So appreciate your attention. Thank you.